Welcome, call the uh, Wichita Board of Education, October 7th, 2024, uh, meeting to order. Uh, we welcome you, those in attendance and those watching. The Wichita Public Schools will be the premier district of choice and inspire each student and staff member to thrive and become future ready within the greater community. Roll call, all seven board members are here. Please join with me on a moment of silence. Thank you. The Pledge of Allegiance tonight will be led by the Southeast JROTC, uh, led by Lieutenant Aubrey Asher, Captain Landon Portnier, Sergeant Major Abby Flores, Colonel Na Shaha, Na, Na Shahat, excuse me about that. Uh, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Post the colors. Thank you, sir. Order, arms. Colors reversed. March. Color guard, halt. Outward, face. Forward, march. Round of applause for the Southeast JROTC. Patrick, first item, please. First item under reports, Wichita Public Schools Student Board. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, President Reeser, Vice President Albert, Superintendent Bielefeld, and board members. For those of you who don't know me, I am a proud member of our secondary schools team, and I serve as an executive director. Uh, much, much of my time is devoted to serving principals, but I also have the distinct pleasure of working with some extraordinary student leaders from all of the high schools in our district. And I do so alongside our fearless forward-thinking superintendent in the organization that most of you would refer to or remember as SuperSAC. But thanks to Superintendent Bielefeld's vision, we are really doing our best to work together to make this organization better than ever. And a big part of that is handing o over more ownership and control to our students themselves. So I'm gonna stop talking with that and introduce to you our officers of the new USD 259 Student Board, President Cohen Richardson, Vice President Alexis Marcus, and Secretary, Secretary Landon Hoschild. Good evening, Board of Education members, Superintendent Bielefeld, President Reeser, District Staff, and Community members. My name is Cohen Richardson, and I am honored to stand before you as the Student Board President for the 2024-2025 school year. This year marks a significant shift in how students across Wichita Public Schools are represented and engaged in the decisions that impact us most. In the past, we had the Superintendent's Advisory Council, SuperSAC, which provided students feedback and ideas. 
While this council is valuable, we recognize the need for something more, something that would truly empower students to have a voice at every level of the decision-making process. That's why, starting this school year, we've moved from the advisory council model to a student-led board, representing all high schools in the Wichita Public Schools. This new structure gives students a direct role, not just in providing input, but in shaping initiatives, policies, and programs in real time. Our new student board includes representation on all four of the district's key communities. First, the Classroom and School Involvement Committee will focus on changing the culture of the decline in participation in spirit days, pep assemblies, and other school events, a trend that started during COVID. We ensure that students feel safe and have a sense of belonging that prompts them to participate in activities that brings us together as school committees. By revitalizing these traditions and encouraging more involvement in daily school life, from leadership roles to extracurricular activities, we aim to build the sense of unity and pride that makes our schools vibrant and strong. The College and Career Readiness and Second Step Committee is committed to preparing students for life beyond high school, whether through higher education, trade school, or direct entry into the workforce, while also strengthening social slash emotional learning through programs like Second Step. This ensures that every student is thriving and is future ready. The Community Outreach Committee aims to build stronger connections between schools, families, and community partners, ensuring that students have a will concentrate on the, sorry, have an active role in outreach efforts and volunteering. Finally, the Academic Engagement Committee will concentrate on helping students excel academically by addressing the unique challenges we face in the classroom and within our learning environments. With this new approach, student voices will be woven into the fabric of each committee, ensuring that our perspectives are not only heard, but also valued and acted upon. As a student board president, I'm proud to share that we've established leadership positions on the Wichita Public Schools Student Board to create structure and ensure that we remain productive and focused on the growth of all Wichita Public Schools. These positions include president, vice president, secretary, and four committee chairs, each leading one of our four key areas. This leadership team will guide our efforts, foster collaboration, and ensure that every student's voice is effectively represented in our initiatives. Our focus is not only on fostering dialogue, but also on delivering tangible results. We are committed to executing our goals efficiently and making meaningful progress on key issues that impact students across the district, ensuring our board serves as a catalyst for positive changes. What makes this change so exciting is that it's not just about having a voice, it's about student leadership. We now have a real opportunity to help shape the future of our schools from the inside out in a way that's collaborative and solution focused. Good evening, everyone. My name is Alexis Barkis, and I'm excited to represent Wichita High School South as vice president of our student board this year. As we make the transition from super stack to a student-led board, we understand that we also need to change our mindset in order to have the most impact this year. This August, board members and Dr. Meyer participated in a two-day leadership training at the Kansas Leadership Center downtown. There, we learned foundational skills on how to be leaders on the board in our schools and also in life. We are thankful to our mentor and friend, Seth, for sharing with us his abundance of wisdom as he led us through the training. Redefining leadership. To most of us, when we hear the word leadership, we think of leadership positions. CEO, president, boss, any position of authority. We have learned, though, that this narrative is false. Leadership is not a position, it's an activity. In fact, it's an activity that anyone, therefore everyone, can do. When everyone leads by Ed O'Malley and Julia Fabris McBride says, when everyone leads, solutions to big, important challenges emerge and people make progress together. This sounds great, right? Everyone can be leaders and it would just be amazing. But not everyone does because leadership is risky. When you take initiative, you can try your best, but you don't have control over the outcome. This is what makes leadership a challenge. It's not easy, but when you do it, we find that it's worthwhile to make progress on the issues we care most about. By intentionally acting in these five ways, we can encourage everyone on our student board, in our classrooms, and in our communities to lead. Making leadership less risky for others. Three ways to do this is to celebrate others' leadership efforts, frequently talk about <coughs> leadership as a risky activity, and display taking risks as a leader yourself. Asking powerful questions. Everyone can lead writes powerful questions invites people to explore multiple perspectives. They are open-ended, provoke reflection, and can seldom be answered with one word. I would say that powerful questions are like braille for the blind. They lead the way when the way is not visible. 
Making multiple interpretations. Push past your first interpretation, don't judge a book by its cover, and be willing to be wrong. Acting experimentally. Because no one knows exactly how to solve an adaptive challenge, every solution is an experiment. Experiments, and therefore failed experiments, achieve three things. They reveal aspects of a solution that were not previously known, they help define possible solutions, and they keep a group in the productive zone. These are all key skills that we will be intentionally referring to frequently as we work to bring change to our Wichita High Schools. Thank you for, our t for your time, efforts, and partnership to better our education. Good evening, everybody. My name is Landon Hochschild. I'm a junior at Northeast Magnet, and I'm the student board secretary for the year. Um, Cohen came up here earlier and told you how the student board will look a lot different than it looked last year. And another one of those big differences is we won't meet with you guys every single month with key ideas and changes. But instead, we'll actually come with a strategic plan periodically throughout the year. And we'll use that plan to make change and hopefully make, hopefully make your guys' jobs a little bit easier. Um, I know you just heard a bunch of great information. But the question, real question is, how can we use that information? And what do we need from you guys? And I think that question breaks down into three simple answers. The first answer to that question is we need you guys inside of our schools. One of my favorite studies to look at for this is that is the Hoffield, excuse me, the, it's right here in my notes. <laughs> it's the illumination study, and it's actually called the Hoffield effect. And so in the early 20th century, these businesses just basically asked their workers if they wanted the lights on or off in, the, in their buildings. And what we learned from these studies is that it actually didn't matter at all if the lights were on and off. It mattered if they asked the people if they wanted the lights on and off. And that same principle applies in our schools. If you guys would be willing enough to come into our schools and just simply ask students, administrators, teachers, even office staff their opinion on big subjects, we determined that it will actually increase the value, productivity, and leadership inside our schools. One of my favorite examples of this is actually not coming into Northeast Magnet at the end of last year. He came into our law classroom and he sat down for 45 min minutes answering simple questions about what our district looks like this year and for years to come. And that we gained 20 new students who felt valued and empowered to lead in our school district. And the second thing we need from you is we need you guys to give us the hard truths and have difficult, difficult conversations. We know we're high school students, we're going to have a lot of big ideas, and some of those ideas just flat out won't work. But we want you guys to tell us no and have difficult conversations with us. We don't want you just to hear us and then push us away. The final thing we need from you guys is we need you to understand and consider every single one of your stakeholders in our communities. When I say stakeholders, I mean parents, I mean students, I mean staff, I mean everybody in our communities. Because we believe that there's a lot of people that this, this, all of this rides on, and we believe that we need to consider every single one of those in our big decisions being made. And I actually went around Northeast this last week asking people what, where they feel the least valued at. I asked teachers, students, staff, and they said that they feel least valued in big decisions. Big decisions like things like clear touches coming into our schools. They weren't asked about that, and that makes a big difference. And so we ask that you consider all your stakeholders. And I know we represent a lot of students. We represent a lot of students, but not only students, but staff. And that's a really big number. And when we look at that really big number, it's really easy to get intimidated. But for me, when I look at something big like that, I like to break it down. And when I break that number down, every single one of those numbers has a name. And every single one of those names has a story. And it's our job to help build, change, and grow those stories for the better. I'll pass it off to Cohen to end this off. I'm confident that with the passion, diversity, creativity of our student board, we'll make a meaningful impact on our district this year. Thank you to the Board of Education, Superintendent Bielefeld, Board President Reeser, and everyone else involved in making this shift possible. We're excited about the opportunity to lead, and we can't wait to work together to create positive, lasting changes for all Wichita Public School students. Thank you. Thank you, Cohen, Alexis, and Landon. Oh, I'm sorry, there was a couple questions. First, Melody. <laughs> they got in late, but they did get in we before you sat down. Okay. <laughs> there, there was no way that I could let this, um, wonder, this auspicious grouping of students walk away before giving a comment. I mean, this was fantastic for me to hear 
for me to see you. I've had an opportunity to meet uh, Lyndon at the ICT, tell me, the Beacon. I mean, they had, they had an event, and it was just phenomenal to sit and, and talk with students. And it happened, they happened to all be from Northeast Magnet, but um, I love the fact that this is now student-led, and it's a student-led board versus the super SAC. So it's obvious in listening to each one of you that you have more than something to say. You have some important uh, jewels to share with us, and I'm ready, to, I'm listening, I am listening. So I hope to be able to see you over at South High and East High, and I'll be over to Northeast too, so. Very, very good. It was just wonderful to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Knock. Yeah, I was a part of uh, Super SAC back when I was in high school, and I'm very grateful for the opportunities I had there, but this is long overdue. And I will say that we work for you. You guys, our students, are the most important stakeholder in the room, and to the extent that you don't feel like you're being heard, you don't feel like you're being listened, you don't feel like you're being taken seriously, hold us accountable because we work for you. And with that said, um, there's gonna be a lot of big decisions coming ahead, like with personal electronic devices. I'm gonna be leaning heavily on you guys for insight and advice on how this policy actually looks like in practice. So thank you. Thank you. Next item, good news. Before I, I share you, tonight's good news with you, um, I have the honor on behalf of the Wichita Public Schools team of pausing and inviting you to join me in a thank you to a really important group of community partners. Uh, two weeks ago, I had to look at my calendar because it seemed like longer than two weeks ago. Two weeks ago on September, I believe it was the 23rd, Monday morning, um, we dealt with the unthinkable, which was an incident of violence in our community that happened on the front lawn of an elementary school just as students were entering school. And safe to say, without the very quick response from not only the district family, but community partners that recognized the gravity, not only of uh, the serious incident, but of the safety and welfare of the kids and staff in Cessna Elementary, um, things could have turned out very differently. So we wanted to take an opportunity and specifically acknowledge the folks that, um, that allowed this situation to work out, um, I would say, as well as it possibly could have. Uh, and with the safety of all of our kids and staff involved. So I wanted to acknowledge these partners uh, by name and then ask you to join me in a round of applause for all of them. But I think it's important that, that all of us and our public knows how folks step up to support our kids and to support our staff. So in a matter of minutes, it seemed, Sedgwick County 911 dispatch Sedgwick County Sheriff's Office, as you know, there was a sheriff's officer nearby that heard the call when the initial call came out. The Wichita Police Department, of course, um, they were very collaborative as we communicated quickly and directly with stakeholders. And uh, I think the um, consistency in messaging and the work that we did together to assure that a frightened community of parents heard what they needed to hear as clearly and quickly as they needed to hear it was so important. Sedgwick County EMS, which uh, as you know, responded to the victims that were involved in the criminal act of the Wichita Fire Department and the um, paramedic service that's involved in the Wichita Fire Department. And of course, uh, Dan Rutherford, who is involved throughout our district in taking care of the unexpected quick things that we don't necessarily uh, see happening in buildings and um, Dan responded very quickly to help um, remediate some things on the outside of the building that needed to be remediated quickly 
before kids came to school the very next day. In addition to all those community partners, uh, we have an amazing internal crisis team that moves quickly to take care of kids. And is Terry inside or is she outside? Oh, she's over here. So um, uh, you all know Terry Moses. Terry leads the district's crisis team. And uh, I always know when my phone rings and it's Terry that I have to immediately pay attention. And when my phone rang that Monday morning, uh, we immediately paid attention and got to work quickly. But Terry is an extraordinary leader who leads with the calm and the presence that allows the rest of the team to work with that same calm and presence. Um, because the last thing that our frightened individuals involved in a scary incident need is uh, someone that does not have that level head to help them see that we'll get through this together. So Terry, uh, the entire district crisis team, the folks that provided the mental health support that day, um, the rock stars on our communications team, uh, of course, the Cessna staff. And as you know, honestly, they were the real heroes in this. Um, they knew what to do. They utilized their secured entry. They kept an awful incident outside of the school and kept kids inside where they were safe. And arguably, um, and none of us were in the middle of that, uh, the adrenaline, when crisis happens, your adrenaline buttons start firing on overdrive. And I'm certain that the individuals in that building were experiencing that, but they did what they needed to do and, and kept kids safe and calm and took care of the parents that arrived on scene. Our parents were amazing in how they responded and how they supported kids, and of course, our kiddos. Um, and it was really cool. Susan was at the scene helping with checkout as parents were coming to pick kids up, and some of the kiddos didn't even know that anything was going on, which, frankly, is exactly what you would hope to be the case. Um, and of course, United Teachers of Wichita, Mike and Katie, came on site and offered their support. It was, um, it was an awful situation and one that we hope um, no citizen and no member of our school community has to deal with again. But we have an army of people that band together to support our kids. And I hope that you can help me in um, sharing a round of applause so that our community partners and our district partners all hear the level of esteem and gratefulness we have for everything they did to support our kids. So. Those of you watching and those of you that I hope hear about uh, this acknowledgement tonight, please know that, um, that all of those partners are appreciated. So thank you for the opportunity to salute all of them as we start. Now, for good news, after an estimated 540 board meetings, an estimated 1,400 good news items. Um, I'm here tonight to present my final three good news items to all of you. Uh, as you may know, and folks in the audience may not know, uh, after 24 years in the Wichita Public Schools, I have the good fortune of retiring at the end of this year. And I have uh, I've been asked to step into some new work, effective probably next week when I get back from a planned vacation, to begin serving as the executive director of family and community engagement. So I don't know if yeah you two are still here. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be looking them up. I was super excited to hear that there is a community engagement team with our student group because that will be the focus of my work for the remainder of the school year. And I am super excited to continue to serve. Um, you all know that my passion is for our community and for the kids in our community and uh, the ruler of my universe who is four years old and in a pre-K class in our school district um, is having an amazing start to her school year. She's the fourth generation of my family that has been in a Wichita Public Schools classroom. So it's, it's, um, it's an honor to have that opportunity to really focus on what parents and community want. I appreciate what you said about really asking people what they wanted. That's what I'm gonna be excited to do 
as we strive for ways to better engage our parents in the work of our school district. We know it takes parents being involved and being supportive in whatever ways that means. And we think we know, and it'll be important to take the opportunity to really dig in and better understand what that can look like so that parents can have authentic engagement in all the ways that their schedules, their interests, their own experiences with school allow them to have that involvement. So I'm excited about that, and um, it's been an honor and a privilege to serve the community, and my work is not done. It will just be different. So it's fun to have three really terrific good news items tonight that uh, span the gamut of what we're here to celebrate with good news so the community sees the good stories. So the first item, we have some friends sitting on the far side of the house and we will ask them to come forward because you need to meet this group of rock star teacher leaders. This is the first cohort of the Empower Ed Teacher Fellowship Program. These folks aspire to be the best of the best in classroom leadership. And with Mr. Went leading the charge as he is so capably focused on the leadership pipeline in our district, uh, accompanied by his partners in crime, Ms. Tammy Martin, whom you all know well, and Diane Smokorowski. Uh, we just have an amazing group of teacher leaders that are gonna do great things in our district. And so Mr. Went and the team will introduce you to them tonight. Thank you, Wendy. Well, good evening, members of the board. President Reeser, Vice President Albert, Superintendent Bielefeld. Um, I have some prepared remarks, but I think I want to first capture something I believe that Vice President Barkas said when I think about teacher leadership. And she said, leadership is risky, but it's worth it. And so you have the opportunity tonight to meet some amazing teacher leaders and the work that they're going to do for our system as well. This is cohort one, ground floor, the initial folks for the Empowered Teacher Fellowship. This program was developed as our entry point for our leadership pipeline, as Wendy talked to you about. And if you think about our leadership pipeline as a continuum for our staff, this is the entry point that we're going to have for our certified staff to continue to lead through the future. Um, I talked to Diane and Tammy tonight about the remarks I wanted to make, and I wanted them to be done right now. They said no. They asked me to continue to talk a little bit about the program and how it came to a genesis. And so I thought I would give you a story rather than some research. So I've had the privilege of serving as principal of three of our schools in Wichita Public Schools. Many, many outstanding teachers during that time. And in one particular building, there were two outstanding teacher leaders who came to me with this idea. This was about, about 15 years ago, actually. And they asked, what do you think about the idea of having like a teacher leadership and mentor program in our district? And I said, great idea. I'm the principal of this school. I don't know that that's in my lane right now. So hold on to that thought. Fast forward 15 years, I'm in Superintendent Bielefeld's office talking about our pipeline, and he says, teacher leadership. And I said, hey, I have an idea. And so thinking about the importance of teacher leaders 15 years ago, just giving you kind of an update on those two teachers, one of those teachers is now working with the Kansas Learning Network and is helping teachers across our state become and grow better. The other teacher is the Wichita Public Schools Executive Coordinator for New Teacher Induction. So it worked out pretty well, huh? So one of the lessons I've learned as I close my remarks about being a leader is to work with great people, hire great people, and get out of their way. So with that in mind, I would like to introduce you to the 2017 ASCD Emerging Leader as well as the 2013 Kansas Teacher of the Year, followed by the 2019 National Teacher Hall of Fame inductee, Tammy Martin, Diane Smokorowski. Good evening. It is wonderful to be here with all of you here this evening. Um, as we were trying to identify who would be in this first cohort, we interviewed several people, and I would say it was rigorous. Would you agree? A little rigorous. It was a little rigorous. Yeah. And rigorous, we were. A little, they're all saying yes. <laughs> <laughs> we were looking for three characteristics that seem to bubble up naturally from this group. The first thing that we found out is that they literally carry the WPS Proud hashtag in their hearts. 
They love 259. They want to stay in 259 and grow within our own community. They have this mindset of the we before me. That's what leaders do. We look at the whole community and then how do I fit in that role versus being the center of it all. And finally, they want to stay in the classroom. They want to lead right from where they are. And when we saw these three characteristics come together, we said there is a beautiful trinity of leadership that sets the stage for the possibilities. So that's why these amazing humans and a few more showed up. So beyond just honoring their incredible work that they have in the classroom, um, the fellowship really was a strategic initiative aimed at leadership development and retention. We know that research shows that teachers that feel seen, that feel valued, that feel validated are more likely to stay in the classroom. And so when we're thinking about Wichita Public Schools, we have the hope that these amazing rock stars feel that seen and valued <laughs> feeling that they have a greater sense of belonging and that they want to remain WPS proud for many years to come. So tonight we are thrilled and honored to introduce you to these outstanding fellows who are ready to lead beyond their classrooms and to help shape the direction of our schools. So as we call their names, please join us in celebrating their accomplishments, their leadership, and their commitment to making a lasting impact on our students and community. We'll start with Lakeisha Brooks, math teacher, Education Imagine Academy. Lake Lakeisha, you're going to have to. Uh, oh, step beyond the step shadows. Beyond. Yeah, there Wait. she is. Now, st right. now stay there. <laughs> now stay there. Okay. All right. Stephanie Brooks, reading intervention at Gammon Elementary. Bethany Ensign, SPED and Related Teacher at Dodge Literacy Magnet. Danielle Espinosa, Biology, right here at North High School. Eloisa Haste, ESOL at Leo Verture Elementary. Kristen Harris, First Grade at Ortiz. Patrick Loganville, PE at Limwood. <laughs> Ashley Reed, visual arts teacher at Stuckey. <laughs> Yvonne Sanders, ELA at Krista McAuliffe Academy. <laughs> Rachel Wysong, math at Wilbur. Jessica Taylor, um, early childhood, pre-K at Little Early Childhood Center. <laughs> we had a couple that couldn't be here tonight, so we would also like to recognize Sarah Forrester, Social Studies ESOL newcomer teacher at Southeast High School. Elizabeth Jackson, who I think is currently scoring a volleyball game for the students at Curtis. She's also ELA teacher. And then Erin Lehman, second grade teacher at Cessna Elementary. So, board, thank you for your time and your ongoing support of programs like this fellowship, which honor and empower our teachers while ensuring we retain and develop leaders in the classroom. We'll help drive the success of our students. At this time, we welcome any questions you might have. We definitely appreciate embracing the we over the me, and that's something I know that uh, everyone in the school district really thrives to do. So we appreciate you, and we appreciate your willingness to take this on, and we look forward to hearing about all the wonderful things you guys work on here in the next year. Thank you. Yeah. And Melody, and hang on one second. Melody. I just, I just wanted to say thank you for staying in the classroom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's where it's at. Yeah. We all know it. So I'm just thankful. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for pointing that out, um, Melody. That's very true. May we ask for a photo with you and them? Absolutely. Would the board members please come join us in the photo? Or they could come in <laughs> right come behind. In the back right and then there. we can stand up and stand close to each other. We document it. Smoke. You go get it. Go get it. Okay. 
it's cool to hear the connection between Chris and Tammy. You never know yeah. where impact and where stories are going to happen. Um, likewise, you never know what an impact the investment and the support that community has for our students and the amazing work that happens in our schools um, until you see great things blossom. And I am absolutely confident that through the Legacy Fund Golf Tournament, the dollars that will continue to come in through that effort will benefit our students for years to come. Last Friday was the fifth annual tournament, and if you could have written the script for a perfect day for a golf tournament, Friday would have been it. It was absolutely beautiful. We had a full slate of golfers and a full slate of sponsors of those golfers uh, who wanted to step up and make a difference for WPS kits. So Holly Wilson is here, and I think you will have an opportunity to greet and say thank you once again to the sponsors that have stayed with us through the meeting and through the good news activity. So without further ado, Ms. Holly. Thanks, Wendy. Thanks. So I'm just gonna take a few minutes. I know many of you were at our reception when we got to honor all of our partners, but we did wanna take a moment to make sure the community is very aware of how involved our business community is within our walls. And this Legacy Fund Golf Tournament, we are in the fifth year. I'm gonna give a very high level overview of the day because it just happened Friday. It was gorgeous, probably the most gorgeous day we've had thus far. So we were more than full on Friday. We actually oversold our tournament. So we had 154 players with 38 teams. Um, so we had a couple of extra out there, which was amazing. Um, our legacy fund, we are in the fifth year of this tournament and it has been a smashing success since we've started. Um, when we started this, um, we really were hoping that we could just instill that our legacy is our students and our students are our community's next leaders and by the sound of our student board that was just up here our future is looking pretty bright so i'm pretty excited about where we are headed um, our main goals of the legacy fund are to um, help our kids out with student assistance or i'm sorry tuition assistance for early college academy we help them with um, financial assistance for dual, dual and concurrent credit programs, um, payment assistance for workforce credentials, and industry standard supplies and equipment for career and tech ed classrooms. We wanna make sure that we are providing every opportunity and removing every barrier that we possibly can for our students. And this tournament really helps us fund that. Um, I'm excited to announce that Friday's tournament raised over $113,000 that day alone, which is amazing for our partners to come together. We always promise we're gonna get right to work and start spending that money. CTE is waiting for some credentials, so they would like to pay for their kids to get going. So we'll be working on that diligently in our office. Um, we could not do this work without our sponsors. and. The amount of support um, that we have received through this tournament for our programs has been astounding. Kelly uses the word humbled a lot um, because we are. Every time our partners come in and they help us fund these kind of programs, it is amazing. So without further ado, um, we are going to recognize some of those VIP sponsors. Those are sponsors that give at a level of 3,000 and above. Um, they did get their plaques in the reception tonight, but we want the community to be very aware of who they are and that they do stand next to us as we take our kids into the next um, level of their education. So without further ado, I am going to begin with our presenting sponsor, which is Credit Union of America. They are no strangers to Wichita Public Schools. They jump in just about any time that we, that we ask. Um, I'm gonna bring Frank up here for just a very few words about their involvement in this tournament and how they connect. Welcome, Frank. Thank you. Uh, first, from listening uh, to the young folks sitting right here earlier, uh, Credit Union of America, when you graduate, <laughs> I'm Frank, come and see me. We're always looking for bright young leaders. So, yeah, uh, boy, the tournament uh, was a hit. Uh, you know, we're, we just, someone said earlier, you know, they're humbled to be here. I am as well. Uh, I feel like this whole whole room is full of leaders. You wouldn't be here if you weren't. 
We're just here for the kids, right? We're just trying to make things better, remove barriers, uh, remove the scratchy stuff, as my little granddaughter says, it goes to hide. So uh, we're just happy to do what we can to be a good partner for the school district and to help the kids. So just give us a call. We'll, we're, we're happy to help. So. I know your number. Yeah, you know me now, so. <laughs> and I am going to miss this one right here, so, <laughs> yeah, so. but thank you. Thank, thank you, Frank. Frank. Credit Union of America has been a five-year sponsor of our Legacy Fund Golf Tournament and has made it very possible for us to be able to use all of our sponsor money to give right back to our kids, so they make sure the tournament runs and they make sure that we can pay all those bills, so we are very thankful for them to step up to the plate when we ask them. Um, our rest of our sponsors, we are going to ask them to just stand. Um, not everybody could make it tonight, but if you are still here, we would like you to stand and be recognized. We're going to start with our first um, sponsor tonight. Legacy sponsor at $10,000 is Cruise Corporation, and I know they are not here this evening. Our Believer sponsors, um, that is a $5,000 level give, and our first one is Basis Consulting Engineers. And they are still here. P1 Service. I thought they stayed. Maybe not. Um, per, uh, PEC, Professional Engineering Consultants, and they were not able to join us tonight. Um, Spirit Aero Systems, back there in the back. Um, and last, and, uh, yeah, last train, I mean, train was unable to make it with us tonight. So um, give it a round of applause for our Believer sponsors at $5,000 and above. <laughs> so our last level of sponsorship we want to acknowledge tonight is our Achiever sponsors. And these are our um, donors that give at a $3,000 level, uh, level or above. Um, Alloy Architecture is our first one. Thanks, Alloy. BCS, Building Control Services. Clint. Elite Concrete, um, that's Cristobal. He could not make it here tonight. Friends University, um, they were at our reception. They could not make it here tonight. And our last one, Icon Structures. Thank you, Icon. <laughs> And really the last one this time, Schaefer Architecture. Could you stand up, please? Thank you guys for being here tonight. There's so much work that goes into this tournament. I want to take a few minutes to recognize my staff. Actually, just probably a minute. But if they will stand up when I say their name. Um, to Donna, Neil. To Donna. So Donna coordinates with our sponsors and helps us with a lot of our print marketing, a lot of our social media, anything that we have that goes into this tournament. She's out there making signs and everything that makes this tournament look as good as it really does. Um, our next person up there, um, we have Miss Kawana Bowen. Miss <laughs> Kawana joined our department um, in the throes of planning for our first kickoff breakfast, and I'm just glad she stayed. Um, we love having her in the office, and she has helped a lot tonight pull our um, event together for our sponsor recognition, so we're happy to have her. Um, next we have Miss Lauren Gokin. <laughs> Lauren, um, in my department, she oversees our stealth after school program, so many of you probably know her if you've gone out on site visits with her and saw the great things we're doing with stealth. I get her a little smidge of her, t of her time to work with Legacy, and she helps us with our volunteers. So she helps get everybody scheduled and, and, and around on our course so that we know and have all the help that we possibly can out there. So thank you, Lauren. And last but not least is Miss Kimmy Kennedy. And I did her last for a reason. For those of you that don't know, Kimmy thinks this is her last tournament. She thinks. <laughs> she thinks. Kimmy is retiring from our district after 30 years in April. So please give her a round of applause. She has been with me all five years of this tournament. She's been in the throes of registration when things didn't work, when the wind's blowing so hard that your internet just stops. 
Um, money's blowing in places that you don't want it to go. She has had to deal with everything at registration and does it with a smile on her face. And all of our sponsors know who she is. And some of them look for her every year and are like, she's the one that needs my check. I know I need to pay her. So, Kimmy, thank you for these years. And we're going to miss you. And you just think you're done. <laughs> thank you, team. You can't keep your legacy shirt. <laughs> That is all of our recognition for tonight. So, and Holly, before uh, before you leave, yeah. um, could we have Greer come down and introduce? Yes, Greer? absolutely. So, okay, Greer, if you wouldn't mind coming down. So, um, I think most of the board has already met uh, Greer, but if not, um, Holly, over the past well, since I've been with the district, Holly has <coughs> done really grants and development, which is really kind of two jobs. Um, so with the start of the foundation, Holly will be focusing more on, on the grant side of things, but not giving up the golf tournament completely. She's still going to help with that, right? <laughs> um, but Greer will then uh, take over the foundation and do the development side. So I wanted you guys to put a name with the face and just to introduce Greer to everybody uh, here tonight. So welcome. We're very excited she's here. <laughs> Thank you, Greer. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Do I have any questions? We're good. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. Okay. Our third good news item tonight takes us right into the vision that you have established for the Wichita Public Schools, which in part states that each student and staff member will be inspired to thrive and become future ready within the greater community. And I think there's no way to be more engaged in the greater community than to vote and exercise that um, right that so many have fought for to uh, allow us to vote for the leaders that represent us at the federal, state, and local level as with our school board members. So we have been actively engaged with our friends at the League of Women Voters to register young people and not so young people alike, those who are eligible to vote. And you will hear this um, from our guests, but I will say again, October 15th, October 15th, October 15th, is the deadline to register to vote in the November general election, which as we know will be an important one for our community and our country. So Dr. Lauren Hatfield is here to tell you more about the voter registration and civic engagement opportunities that we have challenged our young people with and I think that you're going to challenge them with some lessons as well so uh, we're pleased to have you here thank you very much for your attention and your celebration of good news in the Wichita Public Schools good evening everyone it's been a been a fun evening of, of good news and we might have to talk about the structure because we might have to make our student board kids go last in the good news thing because none of us can hold a candle to, to them and, and how, amazing, how amazing they are. Um, I'm here really to just introduce Mr. Rob Maddox, who is our uh, social studies curriculum coach for Wichita Public Schools. And um, there was a day we said, hey, Mr. Maddox, we have some ideas related to what we want to do for civic engagement and voter registration. Um, including here's every kid who's going to turn 18 that uh, goes to our schools prior to the November election. So let's talk about how we can get as many kids registered as possible. Um, and then it just snowballed from there into um, this beautiful partnership with the League of Women Voters um, and creating, uh, Mr. Maddox creating lessons for our kids on, on what it means to, to register to research and then to vote. So I'm not going to take any more time other than to introduce Mr. Maddox because he's really done the hard work in all of this. So I want to bring Mr. Maddox forward and let him speak to you this evening about what's been happening in Wichita Public Schools. Welcome, Rob. Thank you, Dr. Hatfield, and good evening, board members and Superintendent Bielefeld. And I want to add on to the accolades I give to Landon, um, I got to attend that workshop with our kids uh, in the summer, and you would have been so proud of them, and that was awesome. So uh, that set my mind onto this. Why? Why are we doing all this? Uh, as a classroom teacher of 21 years and my third year in this role, I know that we have amazing students who are ready to go out and be involved in their community. 
Um, in the social studies world, they tell us that all of our curriculum needs to be about <coughs> college, career, and civic life, and they just call it the C3 framework. Superintendent Bielefeld and I have talked a lot about bringing civics in intentionally to what we present to the kids. Um, and my second lens is as a parent. In our family, four kids have been USD 259 students. Two have graduated. Uh, one's in eighth grade this year and one's in 11th grade. And I thought, what do I want them to see at school in regards to voting? And usually that does me pretty well to operate from that. So I want to share some of this with you on the handout. I don't know if they, did you guys get this handout? Okay. Uh, we will start with the classroom activities. Uh, you can see that in our elementary levels, kindergarten through second grade, and then third through fifth, we're really just introducing the topic to them. What is voting? How does it work? Basically, you're going to hear your parents talk about this. What does all of that mean, and what are they going to be going off to do? In middle school, they learn more about why voting is important, okay? Along with other election updates, the electoral college, and then when we get to our high school activities, those are more about asking kind of an existential question, do we have a duty to vote, okay? So those are our classroom activities, the lessons that they will learn. Uh, we cannot just announce that it's time to register and it's time to vote, and they will all magically go and do it. We want to present them with the why and the how. How can you go out and do this? Uh, on the right side of that first page is a document I created, and on the digital one there are links. We are teaching our seniors, explicitly teaching them, if you're old enough to register, how can you go out and register? Where can you vote? When can you vote? Uh, making a plan, researching issues from credible sites and sources, and then sharing your plans with your family so they can hold you accountable, and you follow through and you go out and you get your voting done. The number I'm remembering of 18-year-old students who will be 18 uh, by the election eligible to vote was about 1,400 kids. Um, we cannot require that they register to vote, but we can sure teach them how, have a conversation about it, and encourage them to do so. Uh, on the back of that handout, uh, this is to let you know about our digital mock election we're going to have on Tuesday, November 5th. It's going to be administered digitally to all of our students K-12. It was, is being developed with our uh, digital literacy and citizenship team, Smoke and Josh Errett specifically. Um, the ballot will mirror our state's presidential ballot, and we are encouraging students who want to help out with that process. They're not going to be able to create the election, but they will be able to help their teachers by advertising the election within their school, uh, encouraging their classmates to vote, and even helping maybe organize the time of day that the vote might be held so that those student leadership groups can be involved with that. Um, and I want to echo what's already been said, uh, a big thank you to the League of Women Voters. Um, they, have, they came to our social studies in service and presented to our teachers. They have visited our classrooms. They have been to um, school events like community nights, parent-teacher nights, and they have helped so much in getting our kids registered to vote. We are extremely thankful for their partnership. I know I've seen Barbara Bell. Barbara, could you give us a wave? Um, she has been very directly involved with getting out to our schools. Um, and Miss Nancy Brown, who is the co-president of the League of Women Voters, is here too. And their partnership has been outstanding. So I thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Before we call the next item, um, we would, the board would like to express their appreciation, uh, Wendy, for all you've done all these years, uh, not only for the board, but for this community, and more importantly, our kids. You have been there 24-7 uh, whenever we've called and needed you, and all these, I wrote down 1,400 good newses, uh, you are one of those good newses. So we thank you, Wendy, for all you've done. You are a true public servant. Thank you. And forever Windwagon 44? Yes, I...
Okay. Patrick, next item, please. Next item, United Teachers of Wichita. Welcome, Katie. Hi, good evening, um, President Reeser, Vice President Albert, Superintendent Bielefeld, and distinguished board members. Um, I wanted to start today with some more good news. Um, we recently received another $10,000 grant from the Reading Opens the World grant. And um, I know several of you came to our celebration two years ago um, where we um, celebrated how um, that made an impact on the third grade literacy goals. And so we're really excited. I have um, Alma with me. She's an ESOL teacher at Cloud. And she is um, Mr. Alvarez, um, Deputy Superintendent Alvarez, um, has been working with us on this project. And um, the results have been amazing. Um, I'm going to let her share, and then I'm going to share something I heard from one of the principals when I went and popped by their school as well. So, so thank you, and good evening. Again, my name is Alma Rivas, and I am one of six teachers that is in this program. It is so exciting to get it started. We're getting ready to start this this year in the next couple of weeks. Um, but it's very, very exciting uh, from a teacher's point of view to be able to see the, the kids when they're reading and when they get their books. Um, you know, they, 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 on the, of course, over teens, they're like, oh, Ms. Rivas, I have this little library, and I'm creating a library, and I'm reading to my kids, and all of those stories are really great, but what's great for me is as a teacher, like I said, from a teacher's point of view, to see the growth that these kids make, and the growth comes from enjoying reading. Tracy Callard is a very, very good friend of mine. She retired last year, but I've known her for over 20 years. It was kind of funny. We, were, you know, we go back a long way. But when she presented this program to me, she says, "We're going to read, and you're going to read out loud, just like you always love to." And so when we started this program, I see the excitement, you know, that the kids have when they're reading, and that to me is so much more important because they're reading just for fun. They're not reading, you know, to fill out the worksheets that us teachers have them do every single day. Um, but then besides that, when I get the opportunity to talk to parents, especially those that speak Spanish, um, they don't have a lot of books in their homes. They don't have the opportunity to sit down with their kids because you know, they don't have the income to buy the books. So when they get these books, they get super, super excited. And I get excited to be able to talk to them. Um, so it's just over, you know, it's just very, a very, very nice program that we have, and I'm so grateful. You know, we've been talking tonight about good news. I'm extremely grateful for these kids, all of these kids. We have kids who, we pick those kids who we call the bubble kids who have not um, met benchmarks for FastBridge, which is where we, um, what we use to test these kids. And at the end of the year, when we test them for the third, third time in the spring, you know, going from, oh, I didn't meet benchmarks to wait, I, you know, I, I met benchmarks and not only that, but I'm higher, my score is higher. It's like, oh, yes. And I just have to share a story. This kid was not in our program, but I was a second grade teacher last year. And when he came to me, he read one word on FastBridge. Well, this year after FastBridge, he is now College Pathways. And that just to me is so amazing because as teachers and as parents, um, you know, me being a parent too, every time we have an opportunity to present these kids with just the chances to read anything, please let's do that because that's what makes a difference. You know, empowering parents to be, yes, we are great parents, but we need to teach them sometimes to be, you know, leaders for their kids as well. So we appreciate that information. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I just have to say thank you so much for taking this on. And, and she's amazing, and she does great work. Um, and I was going to share about um, I was over at uh, Ortiz and um, talking with Mr. Uh, Quillen. And um, he was talking about how he had a student that participated last year. And they came in, and they were uh, tier three. So they were very, very behind in their reading and uh, bragged about their books and their teacher that read with them after school. And that, that student by the end of the year was, had met, met the benchmark. And so sometimes they just need a little extra push after school. 
Um, and then to be able to take those books home and read them over and over and over again and practice, and it makes a huge difference. So I just want to say and thank building, you. And building those relationships, too, with the students is amazing because we, as teachers, we don't always have the time because our day is, come on, come on, come on, come on. But when you do have that little extra time after school to, to build those connections and then to talk about the books and, um, you know, build the background knowledge or make references to, hey, I know that. That's that's the amazing part too, and that's what makes kids want to read as well. So, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for, um, thank you so much for all you do and for coming with me here to <laughs> talk about thank this. You. So she was a little nervous, and she was outstanding. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say um, Wendy did such an amazing job of recognizing the staff and community members and um, gosh that Cessna incident it was it was it was terrifying um, I did want to also add SEIU arrived with snacks um, Isa um, and his team came and and brought snacks for the staff um, and just express our gratitude to the teachers and staff for their quick actions to ensure that all the students were safe during that shooting incident two Mondays ago um, I do want to thank Knock Mel and Melody. They came by our office and they met with eight teachers um, to talk kind of through that incident and just moving forward. And um, maybe if hopefully there's not ever anything like this again, but just some things to keep in mind if there is that um, to help with staff well being, um, their emotional well being. So, um, and Julie, thank you for sending kind notes to the Cessna teachers. Um, several of them that have already receive those and really appreciate appreciate that um, when we visited with the staff and knock and melody were there as well there were a couple things that kind of stood out um, and it was it was more of that emotional well-being of the staff I know our kids were safe our teachers our staff did an excellent job with those kiddos um, and keeping them sta safe and calm during a very scary scary time um, because there's been you know gun violence in our country um, there, it's, it's extremely terrifying as a teacher to be in a classroom with children and hear gunshots outside your window. Um, and, and listening to the teachers relive, um, you know, getting the kids on the floor. And, um, and it was very, very emotional to hear how scared they were. Um, I know that um, Afterwards, when we debriefed, they, they do have um, access to ComSec and to the front of the line, and we appreciate that. But um, speaking with staff, um, a couple of things that in the future might be important, and hopefully nothing like this ever happens again, but um, some of our staff members didn't receive lunch because um, they'd ordered in some food, and um, it was late after their lunchtime, and they felt unable to leave the school premises. Um, teachers also reported there were a lot of people around, but um, people didn't like come in and check on them. Like, hey, can I watch your class for a few minutes so you can go call a family member? Or do you need a break? Did you get something to eat today? Just little things like that to check in on our staff's well-being. Um, they also wanted to see um, the superintendent or deputy superintendent to check on them as well. Um, some leadership. Um, higher leadership they just wanted to to see that they were cared for um, a teacher did make a request for support while talking with her students since they were in that very front hallway um, with her class the next day because they were very scared with all the the noise outside um, and no one came to do that um, a couple other things that they discussed was that there were no administrators in the building during this crisis and so a question that the staff had was, is it necessary to pull both the assistant principal and principal for meetings during the school day? Um, it's probably important to have at least one of them there if there's an emergency. And um, one of, one of the, the biggest concerns, I think they were pretty shook up, um, especially in the front where they heard the noises. And um, their, their one question was, should school remain open if there's blood on the front steps from a shooting incident? It was a significant trauma for both our staff and students. So um, that was just a few things that they shared with Melody and Nock and I. Did I miss anything? Okay. Yeah. 
Um, so very, very scary. And um, that was um, just something that I wanted to make sure in the future that we check in on, on those, those teachers maybe. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is I've been in an office for three years at the UTW office. And um, student behavior, for some reason this year, seems more challenging, especially in our elementary schools, than I've seen in this three, past three years. We've received an increase in reports of students that are like destroying property, eloping from school, and um, causing harm. And I just want to say that our schools need to be safe places for both of our students and our staff. And um, we talk a lot about academic achievement, and that's directly tied to um, the conditions in our, in our schools. And we want to make sure that um, it, when, when there's a lot of behavior concerns, it's hard for um, students to focus on learning. So we want to make sure that we look at ways to support our teachers through, through this time. Um, I do think that these challenges are too big for any one of us to handle alone and that as a district that we need to come together and find solutions to create a safer and more supportive environment for everyone. Um, I've had a couple conversations with superintendent about some of these concerns and I know he has some, some ideas moving forward. So um, I appreciate those discussions, but I did want to make sure that um, you, you were told that there's been some, some major um, concerns this year. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Katie. I did have a question. Oh, yes, Melody. Thank you. So um, I just wanted to add to what it is that Katie shared. Uh, yes, the conversation, first of all, thank you to Katie and Mike for inviting, I believe you invited the board to actually meet with um, some of the teachers at Cessna. And it was, um, it, it, it was, it was surreal to hear first account, you know, from, from the teachers that were there, their account of what actually happened that day and how it, how it psychologically have impacted them and thereby psychologically more than likely impacted some of the students. So I just wanted to be able to say that um, it, 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 once again, it, it was just very um, heart-wrenching to hear what they had to experience, even though it didn't happen in their classroom, it was right there. And they, it was as though they were experiencing it firsthand. Um, I wanted to be able to give voice to that because I continue to hear that uh, from the very teachers that were uh, in the round circle uh, with us. So um, thank you to everyone, the first responders, the um, crisis team, uh, district leadership, building leadership, teachers more specifically, because they have those children in their classroom. They have to <coughs> hold them, listen to them, uh, n make them feel safe, not only that day, but every day after that, because they're theirs. When, you're, when you teach, they're, the students are your, yours for that period of time. Um, so I just wanted to thank them again for um, being there for our students and, and everyone else that uh, came and, and um, intervened and uh, just prayers for the family because, I mean, this was a horrific event uh, for all around. So once again, I appreciate everyone that intervened. Kathy? Thank you. Katie, how are the students and the teachers doing right now? And then I have a follow-up to that. That's OK. Sorry. That's all right. Um, so um, I've kind of just been checking in on them. Um, it's the, they said they had a lockdown. Was it last week? There was something in the neighborhood. And, um, and the kids in that front hallway were like, are we safe? They were very worried about that. Okay. Um, and, and they were like, no, we're okay. It's something in the neighborhood. Um, 
they said also when they hear like an intercom or like a loud noise, it's just kind of, um, what's the word? Triggers. Uh, yes, yes, it, it brings them back. Um, so, you know, I think it's gonna take some time. Um, but yeah, they were extremely scared. Well, I personally know a mother of a kindergartner that saw what happened. Mm -hmm. And I wanna commend the counselor at Cessna yeah. because the counselor has been working with her and she's coming through it. But what can the board do for the staff of Cessna right now? Um, I, I mean, we went by and we brought some coolers with some drinks and just checked in on teachers. Hey, how are your students doing? How are you doing? And that meant so much to them, just like somebody cares enough to say, hey, how are you doing? Other schools also came by and brought snacks and they really appreciated that as well. So um, kind of like what Landon said earlier, just a visible presence from the board would be supportive and helpful. That'd be wonderful. Okay. And I know um, Julie wrote some cards right. and yeah, we, yeah. I mean, Thank that, you for giving us this follow up because I too have been thinking about those kids and the trauma yeah. that they experienced with that. So, and when these things happen, we can always look back and say what we should have done, what we could have done. And instead of beating ourselves up, we just need to move forward, like you said, in the hopefully unlikely event that should happen again. But I think if it does, we'll be more prepared and our safety department with Terry and Wichita PD and everybody just, I mean, I got the text right away. So um, thank you for following up with that. Yeah. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you, Kathy. Knock. So again, let's pray that this never happens again, but to prepare for the worst, um, in terms of uh, that process with canceling school, because you know, just again, from my understanding, like the teachers definitely were not in a capacity to teach, the students definitely were not in a capacity to learn. Is that a board policy or would that? That's an administrative decision that was made, and okay. we thought about it, right? We, we took all the factors into account and kind of pros and cons and uh, made the decision that we thought was best at the time with the information we had. Yeah, so, but that's administrative decision. That's not a board policy. Thank you, Katie. Yeah, thank you. Patrick, next item. Next item, Service Employees International. Welcome, Esau. Good evening, everybody. Uh, President Albert, and, uh, <laughs> Superintendent Bellafield. Um, sorry, guys. I've uh, I've just been listening to what everybody's been talking about, you know, and and I I do remember what a good job I thought everybody did when I walked up that afternoon and realized that they were lining the kids up for the buses, and the kids lining up for the buses didn't really have any idea what was going on, and. And I think that's really a testament of what the teachers did and what they stepped up to. Um, but you know, I, I hate that we're just gonna pray that it doesn't happen again or hope that it doesn't happen again. And I mean, let's be honest, these things happen pretty readily in our society. And you know, thoughts and prayers aren't fixing it. So um, I'm glad that you guys talked about voting this evening because I think it's extremely important uh, when people are showing up to vote that we make sure that we're voting for candidates that support public schools. Um, we're voting for candidates that want to make our society safer. And while I won't tell anybody who to vote for, um, if you value public education, if you value public safety, talk to those candidates. Make sure that they're really trying to fix the problems uh, because they're going to continue to happen. We're going to continue to have these things happen if we don't take some action and change certain parts of our culture. Um, and we as a society have to do that. Um, we can't just make a rule about it. We all have to get together and do it. But uh, we know that a lot of our students experience domestic violence and things at home and, and that makes it hard for them to learn. And you know, I don't need to continue too much on what Katie and everybody said, but uh, we had some paraprofessionals that were allowed to go home because they were so traumatized and we do appreciate the district making sure that they still got paid for that day. Um, that meant a lot to them because when they went to work that morning, they didn't think they were going to experience that. And so uh, we do appreciate all of the mental health help, um, but we've really got to start working on that in our society as a whole so that we make sure that incidents like this don't reoccur again and again because the trauma has been passed down from generation to generation. 
The paraprofessionals have been calling a lot. Um, same things that Katie was talking about with the uh, destruction of property in the rooms. We've had a few people that their cars have been uh, damaged. And when you're a worker that comes to school, um, you know, you don't expect your car's going to get beat up that day. Um, but when it does, we do appreciate that the district is taking care of those things. We're just concerned it's going to get extremely expensive. And we know that we're all doing the best that we can. But when a room gets torn up, it costs money. And like Katie said, the other kids aren't learning. So, um, you know, we know that you guys are doing what you have to um, in this situation. But uh, any creativity, any being present in the building, uh, as much as you guys can be present in the schools, that really does mean a lot to the kids. And I know some of you have full-time jobs of your own, and it, it's, excuse me, very difficult to go in there every day, but I, I think that's a lot of what we need right now. So um, thank you for giving us an opportunity to speak tonight, and, uh, you know, we, uh, we appreciate everything that you guys are doing. I know those are tough decisions that administration has to make. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of parents that couldn't just leave work and go pick their kids up, and those kids need to be taken care of as well. So um, thank you for everything you guys have done. Thank you, Esau. Patrick, next item. Next item, public communications. Our first speaker is Jana Price. Jana, welcome. Uh, for Board of Comment speakers, you have three minutes to address the board, and Patrick will hand out any items that you have for the board members. So welcome and thank you. Thank you. Very cold in this room. My name is Jana Price. My husband Rodney and I are the proud parents of Matthew, who is a nonverbal Down syndrome child that is 11 years old and is a fifth grade student at Isley in the Mixed Abilities Program. When my husband and I found out that our son had Down syndrome, we were scared. Fear of the unknown, would we be able to provide for him? And how would the world treat him? We knew he had Down syndrome before he was born, so we got involved early on with programs around town. Learning, meeting people, having discussions about everything from feeding issues to potty training to schools. It was then that we learned about Isley and the robust, top-notch mixed abilities program, their amazing staff and their inclusion, so that is where we wanted him to go. We also started our own research, reading literature about Down syndrome and education strategies. While there are great resources out there, I don't think people who don't have a child with Down syndrome can fully grasp their needs. Reading books, taking classes or college degrees is not the same thing as having a child with Down syndrome. We know our children better than anyone. He has been at Isley since he was four years old. He knows the staff, students, routine, and structure of Isley. We were over the moon thrilled to hear that Isley was expanding to include grades six through eight. Our prayers had been answered. Matthew has the structure and routine right now at Isley and we learned last Monday that it might be stripped away. He might have to start all over and I, I question, do any of you know the impact that could have on a child who is so dependent on routine? He has been at Isley for 64% of his school life. I can tell you that if his daily routine gets out of whack for whatever reason, it's difficult. I don't know how much time you've spent with children with Down syndrome, but every day is a good day. People with Down syndrome stop and smell the roses, and they have an ability just by being themselves to exude positive energy. If you take mixed abilities away from Isley, you are robbing the students and staff of being around people who don't take anything for granted and live life to the fullest each and every day. It helps teach patience, compassion, empathy, and understanding. Our society is so divided in so many ways, and our kids hear all about the bad things happening in the world. People with Down syndrome <coughs> teach others to just enjoy life, take things as it comes, that everything will be okay. In your packet, I've outlined a few suggestions that I have about ways to keep mixed abilities at Isley. I've also included pictures of our son, Matthew, some alone, showing how fun he's ha how much fun he's having, 
and others with his general ed peers. This is such a great learning, learning opportunity for all of the students at Isley. School is a perfect place for children to learn that every person is different. It might be the way they look, talk, walk, and dress. Please don't take this opportunity away from all of the students at Isley. Thank you. Thank you, Jana. Patrick, next speaker. Next speaker, Scotty Schmedler. Welcome, Scotty. I don't have anything to hand out. That's okay. You have three minutes to, stop, to speak. Yes, ma'am. First off, good evening. As he said, I am Scotty Schmeidler. Um, what I'd like to bring to your attention this evening is accessibility in schools and building construction. When these schools were built, most of them are very old. And children or family members, teachers, parents, nobody really took into consideration the community with disabilities. I have a five-year-old son who is my world but he was born with spina bifida unknowingly. A lot has changed, and it's come to my knowledge that not all schools are handicap accessible, and I'd like to see if we can make that change. Because um, it's not just the students, it's also, like I said, anyone involved in the education community. There's, from third grade up, in Harry Street Elementary, they do not have a way to get to the second floor without using the stairs. Anyone can either be born with a disability or occur one through accidents, vehicular accidents, or after school incidents of sports. How are students or anyone else supposed to go up to the second story? A ways we can fix this is with the apologize is with the uh, capital outlay fund is that's exactly what it was made for is instances like this along with fundraisers which a lot of people would be very willing to join in on that's all thank you uh, speaker that was the third? That was the second. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Patrick. Uh, third speaker is Courtney Vanek. Good evening. My name is Courtney Vanek, and my husband and I are proud parents of three young children. Our five-year-old son, Jimo, who has Down syndrome, attends Isley Elementary Magnet School, where he's enrolled in the Mixed Abilities program. From before Jimo was even born, we have been thoughtfully planning for raising a child with special needs. Less than a year ago, we moved to ensure he could participate in the Mixed Abilities program at Isley Elementary. Jimo is thriving. My husband and I were thrilled to hear that the school district <coughs> is considering expanding Isley to include grades six through eight. However, when we heard that this plan included relocating the mixed abilities program, we were devastated. Relocating a group of children with special needs can disrupt their sense of stability. Children learn best when they feel safe and secure. And for children with special needs, that sense of security comes from stable routines and structure. Many of the kids in this program have spent most of their lives in the same building with the same teachers, paraprofessionals, and therapists, and alongside familiar, exceptional, and non-exceptional peers. They experience greater difficulty with change than non-exceptional children. Uprooting them could significantly impact their emotional, social, behavioral, and academic development, which is a serious concern of ours. Moving to a new school usually overwhelms children with special needs, causing emotional distress and anxiety. They lose their sense of belonging. Negative behavioral changes can emerge. The disruption of routine can lead to regression in crucial skills that they've spent years mastering. It is also important to recognize how non-exceptional non children in the building gain from the current inclusive environment. 
When non-exceptional children are exposed to peers with a range of abilities, they develop empathy, compassion, and a comfort level. They learn to see a disability as a natural part of, a, of human diversity rather than something that is to be avoided. Inclusive settings also promote leadership skills in non-exceptional children who learn how to mentor others. This experience prepares them to contribute to a more inclusive, compassionate, and understanding world. For parents and teachers engaged in the special needs education of children, Isley enjoys a well-deserved, outstanding reputation. It works. It is, therefore, it is therefore baffling to us why this board would consider radical changes to an outstanding program. It would be a mistake to remove the, the district's strongest mixed abilities program from Isley. Thank you. Thank you, Courtney. Patrick, next item, please. Next item, under education, strategic plan, goal number one, system support, interim goal, increase fully qualified staff. Mr. Superintendent, I'll let you introduce the topic. Are you flying solo tonight? Mr. Heath, are you by yourself? I'm by myself. All right, rock and roll. I'm flying solo. Okay, so part of uh, strategic plan goal number one, uh, which is all about academic success for our students, we know that the uh, one of the most um, influential pieces of uh, a student's ability to excel in the classroom is the teacher in front of them. Um, and we know, uh, you know, that we've been struggling to um, fill vacancies over the past few years, and um, we decided it was important enough to put in as a uh, part of our strategic plan goal um, that without a great, highly qualified teacher in every classroom, uh, we'll never be able to see the academic success that we hope for. So. Um, I called on Sean tonight to s specifically talk about this goal and um, both kind of where we're at and where we're headed. So I'll hand it off. Thank you. Thank Welcome, you. Sean. Good evening, President Reeser, Vice President Albert, Superintendent Bielefeld, and Board of Education members. I'm Sean Hudspeth. I am the Chief Human Resources Officer for USD 259, and it is a pleasure to be here to give you this update tonight for informational purposes. As uh, the superintendent said, this is uh, all about strategic goal number one. And what we're talking about is the system support, the internal systems or operational support that my team and I lead with respect to probably one of its most critical assets, and that is human capital. So tonight, we're going to talk about how we get to uh, increasing the number of fully qualified instructional staff from 87% to 90% by the end of this school year in May 2025. To begin, I want to give you a little bit of a timeline. You'll see the timeline that is up there. This started last February. That timeline began when you all made the decision in February of 2024 to close six buildings throughout the district. So then in March, we began uh, preparing informational packets, preparing uh, to meet with all of the affected staff about their future options across the district. From February all the way through May, workshops, career placement, coaching and in-district job fairs began and concluded at the end of the school year. By June, June 3rd, all staff at closing schools had found a new home and or were placed at a new location across the district. Finally, in August, new staff orientation was on 8-1 of 2024, and we welcomed 108 new teachers to Wichita Public Schools for this academic year. Each person, as I said, had a designated HR support team. This was one-on-one -on -one support with the Taleo application process, links to vacancies all across the district, assistance with their application facilitation, and they had a direct point of contact for any HR or employee benefits related questions as they looked to make that transition from one building to the next. In their packet, we also included things like a building and position interest form. <coughs> they got an opportunity to try and tell us where they might like to go. So if they were going out of Hadley, maybe they wanted to go to a different middle school. Maybe they wanted to go to a different uh, elementary school. I remember meeting with a lady from Hadley, and she said, you know what, I really want to teach SPED at an elementary school. And we found her that spot, and she's teaching kindergarten and welcomed her child to the school with her so she gets to take her little one with her each day. So these were great to try and help people uh, figure out where they wanted to be, and we asked for that form to be into us no later than April 1st of this year. 
Of course, we had HR and employee benefit support. You guys were the ones that allowed us to continue the robust um, mental health supports and the Mental Health Matters program through our partners with ComPsych and some district uh, initiatives that we've been doing and will continue to do throughout this school year as part of our HR strategic plan. But we wanted to make sure that even though it was traumatic for some people to have to pack up and move and vacate their classroom that they might have been in for 15 or 20 years, we were prepared to assist them in any way possible. Application workshops, as I mentioned, were held across the district. We had people that were very nervous and uneasy about wanting to sit down in front of a new supervisor and essentially have to interview, potentially, for a new home within the district, something they may have not done in two years, 10 years, maybe even 20 years. So we held four different ones, February 21st, March 19th, March 27th, and April 10th. We did this in the late afternoon to early evening where they could come in and just drop in and visit with one of our team or they could sign up for an individual specialized appointment to meet with somebody that was there to help walk them through the process step by step. We also included in the packets to help in this transition process the employee readiness timeline. We created a checklist that you will see on your screens and in your packets of what they needed to do beginning in February all the way through April and then what they needed to conclude in the month of May alone just so they could get prepared, have their things packed and be ready to move by the district to wherever their new home was going to be. We had a little bit of a flow chart that was created too about what they needed to do if they needed a little help a lot of help and then they could follow the path knowing that there was always somebody at the end willing to help them every step of the way in this process. We had save the date interview fairs. We brought all of our principals and hiring supervisors and managers from across the district to the district uh, offices there at AMAC and we set them up and then we had people lined up ready to go. My team knocked it out of the park with respect to coordination of events. People walked in, they had multiple interviews, they were leaving with offers in hand, ready to go sometimes. Others, it might have been a day or two because they were processing them just as fast as they could, but it was exciting to watch things come together as planned. We also included a location guide because some people just weren't familiar enough with the city because they were still so new to the district where all of our buildings were and we broke that down for them as well. We also were able to offer them through the assistance of this board a commitment bonus, moving pay, professional leave time, time for them to not have to take from away from their normal leave time, but giving them up to 10 hours to leave their building and potentially go interview when a principal or another hiring supervisor called upon them. And of course, there was pay protection and supplemental and secondary jobs that they were made aware of. The Transform 24 team that was created uh, developed a very robust frequently asked question section. And we broke that down and wanted to break out for you here what the things were as far as the top five things. Number one, that was to uh, have everybody know that they were valued and that they were going to be taken care of. Number two, priority staff in hiring decisions. We made those affected staff members a priority. That means that if you were a hiring manager, you opened up your Taleo inbox and looked at your jobs, you saw specifically who was coming to you and applying from within the district. You couldn't go external at that point. We wanted to make sure all these folks found a home. Programs that were moving, we tried to assist folks and make sure they had answers to all their questions about which programs and where they were moving. That was the key. When we move programs, a lot of times staff wanted to follow where the students were going to go. So we tried to ensure that as best as possible. There was support throughout the entire process and of course, there was moving assistance. Facilities was able to come together and I can't thank the folks in facilities and Heavy Hall enough. Uh, Jenny Robinson, Christy Zarnick, uh, they were fantastic. I am happy to report that we had boxes delivered in May to every affected staff member. They were packed by June 1. Over the course of the summer, everybody moved, and at the debrief that we just had some two, three weeks ago, 
we had zero lost items and zero damaged items after moving 300 and some teachers across this district and staff. So I alluded to the term priority staff, and this was a um, kind of a dashboard that we were very familiar with in our world as we look to move people. And you'll see that we kind of started with the phase one title pairs that were in ESSER positions, phase one other, two, which is certified staff, those are your teachers, phase two, classified staff, and then of course, administrators. What you're really wanting to focus on here and what the data captures as far as key staffing metrics include the number of separations, which was 42, positions filled, we filled 383. We got down to none to fill, and that was out of 425 total affected staff. So that's when we knew we had placed everybody across all categories that needed to be placed, and that was achieved in that 383 number. Well, we say, ah, summer, right? We all enjoy summer, but we weren't done. We were just still kicking it into high gear. And at this point in June, we came around by June 3rd, which is the statutory deadline. We had everybody placed, as I'd already said, and now we were ready to open the door and start recruiting people external to the district. So these are the folks that had applied to come to USD 259 for the school year, student teachers, folks on contract, all of those folks were external recruiting and it was in full swing. In July, that continued with various open positions. There was a high volume of staff also going through onboarding, background checks, drug screening, everything they needed to do to be ready to go. Well, then August 1st came. Day of excitement, that's D-Day, right? We were ready to jump in and we welcomed 108 new teachers to our new staff orientation at Northwest High School, which some of you got to be a part of. And that was the lowest number of open teaching positions that we started the school year with in over a decade in Wichita Public Schools. So if you think about it, 383 we were able to fill because we moved staff around. You add that to another 108, that would have been almost 491 positions that we would have had to fill if it were just a normal school year. So again, we were only having to bring in about 25% of what we normally had to do. So you can see the volume that we go through on a regular basis with our educators and our recruiting. I've also included a little bit about our turnover statistics. This is a seven year history, but what I really want you to focus on is this highlights a trend in the district's retention efforts, showing that despite the challenges brought on by the pandemic, turnover rates have steadily improved. At the end of this year in the center column, the percent of turnover was 8.1%. That's the percent of voluntary terms to uh, the percent of turnover and the total number of employees. If you count all of them together, we were still at 9%, which is the lowest since you saw the 2021 school year. Another uh, measure that we looked at, and just so you're aware, is that don't forget our substitutes, or what we like to call our guest staff. They're in very important to the human resource element that we bring to the district because we currently have 747 active guest or substitute staff in our system. Another 49 are currently in the onboarding process, and we have 21 that are currently under review and interviewing as of this presentation. What I'm able to offer you is the first couple of months of where we've sat with guest staff. You'll see the absences and vacancies by month, and we've had almost 12,000 absences or vacancies just since we started school almost nine weeks ago. Coverage requests, we get those in because sometimes not every building needs somebody to cover that. They might be able to cover it within the building, but we've had coverage requests just a little over 9,400. We've managed to fill just north of 8,000 of those. So on average, we're filling 85.15%. At this time last year, we were still already putting out high absence alerts and we were only filling in the 70 percentile. As the year goes on and progresses, there's going to be more absences. We're bound to be faced with that during cold and flu season, everything else that might come along. And so again, we're happy that we have enough staff that are truly able to fill absences in the classroom. 
At the bottom of the slide, I also want to draw your attention that as of October 1, there are currently 81 vacancies being covered by long-term subs who are certified. Only 44 of those positions are posted teaching positions. The rest of them are typically filled by long-term subs who have retired from the district or folks that still maintain Kansas licensing credentials. These are people that might be on family medical leave, they might be on active military duty, they may be out on maternity leave, but some of these positions also were able to be what we call temporary positions that were added by the budgeting office that we could fill based upon needs once students got into the building and we saw some last minute needs to uh, add staff in various areas. Where are we at with the qualified staff? So as of today, again, as of February 2024, we were at 87%. 383 staff members have moved internally to other buildings. 108 new teachers were hired as of 8-1. And again, 44 certified guest staff are currently filling open teaching spots. We currently are exceeding the goal of 90% of fully qualified in our schools. However, in February 2025, we will finalize the certification and licensure process through what is known as the EDCS, the Education Data Collection System. That will give us our true percentage, which we anticipate still meeting our goal of 90% or higher. And so, again, I can't sit here today and say we're at 93%, 94%, but you look at 4,000 teachers and you think, you know, 90% of that's 3,600. So, you know, I think we're probably doing a good job. But what it really comes down to is what my team is actively working on right now is the licensure and the auditing to make sure that even though you have a social studies teacher in a classroom, are they licensed to teach social studies? If you have a special education teacher, if their endorsement is um, high needs or uh, so forth, you know, are they really doing low, e low needs or something like that or mixed abilities? So we just need to make sure that we have all those endorsements and they have been working very hard to make sure that we have all that in place. So that is the primary goal is to achieve that. We hope to be back in the spring and be able to share with you that we have either met the 90% or surpassed that, which is my hopeful goal. Any questions? So before uh, the board jumps in, I do, Scott, Sean mentioned something and kind of glossed over it and I wanna make sure, because I, I do think this is a question that as board members you probably heard. Um, what do we do when we come back in August and all of a sudden we've seen a spike in a enrollment in a certain building or a certain grade level sometimes? Um, you know, Sean mentioned adding staff is needed, uh, but walk us through a little bit maybe that first, the first month of school or even beyond that, to be honest. Um, last year we added newcomer teachers at the, in the middle of the year. So um, we're, we're constantly monitoring class size, we're constantly listening to principals and then we we will act and we will add positions as needed. That is correct. So, um, you know, the budget office gives us a little bit of latitude, if you will. So we'll go to them and of course, elementary, secondary, student support services that houses our special education needs. If we're getting a lot of newcomers in buildings, we had folks transfer, but they had a robust enrollment period. I mean, we're as administrators, we're watching enrollment daily from the time school starts up until count day and then a little beyond. But it's that first 30 days that we're really tuned in to make sure that do they have adequate staff? I mean, and if class sizes do get a little too large, how can we shift and make the adjustments so that people aren't totally bogged down? Good point. Yep, thank you, Sean. You bet. All right, Sean, I think that, I think that, oh, did you? No, they're yeah, co they're coming up slow tonight for some reason. Okay. Uh, Melody's Melody. got to get a little faster hitting that button. No, that's okay. <laughs> Melody? Uh, so I want to make sure that I understand uh, what our vacancy rate, what, what our vacancy is on um, actual licensed teachers. How, how many are vacant positions do we have for licensed teachers? Well, as of 335 this afternoon, there are 51 open teaching positions in this so district. So are 51. And that still keeps us at that 90% um, that you're stating, or that you just stated earlier. Again, you gotta verify everybody's credentials and licensing, sure. but if you're just looking at the numbers by themselves, you know, 4,000 some odd teachers, minus 51, you're gonna be in a 90th percentile. Okay, so we're 
that's a collective. It, Correct. That's not specific. Correct. To the licensure, the actual licensure. And I'll and I'll break that down for you a little further, mm -hmm. uh, Ms. McRae. Uh, Twelve of those fifty-one positions were elementary, eleven were middle school, six are high school, and twenty-two are special education teaching mm -hmm. vacancies. That's, that was my question. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Melody. Knock? Yeah, that was actually my question about like the uh, disaggregated breakdown in terms of the uh, teaching vacancies. Um, another question I had to, um, so you mentioned uh, 108 new teachers um, on August 3rd, 2024. Um, in terms of like trends, in terms of how many teachers we recruit, each year is about like 100, give and take, or? Actually, we recruit for the last three years since the pandemic, four years, we've recruited almost 400 teachers a year. Okay, so this year we recruited 108? Yeah, each year. Yeah, each yeah. year. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we only, we only recruited 108 because of pushing 383 into the system from closing buildings. another quick question on recruitment since you've raised it um, can you share with me again um, what it is what are our fo our focus and or objectives our goals when we're looking at increasing the diversity within our school district teaching staff so you know the team actually it, several of my talent acquisition people sit on our diversity and equity committee and one of the things that we always look at is the current diversity and equity committee there's there's currently an affirmative action committee that meets internally yes oh okay i was going to say because i'm on what you're on changed. a higher level committee okay. team than the rest of them okay. so okay but yes we do meet quarterly and we look at the affirmative action or what we call our equal opportunity report that is submitted every year mm -hmm. and when we do that we look for areas where there needs to be more robust outreach so we've gone to uh, historically black colleges and universities colleges where uh, Council of Great City Schools has advised us that there might be higher graduates even in other diversified categories such as Asians or Pacific Islanders and other categories that we're able to outreach and try to penetrate those students we work very closely with uh, Dr. Polite and his team to try to kind of get some ideas of where that effort needs to spend because that's a lot of money that comes out of our budget every year. So we are trying to outreach those. Now, traveling has had to pull back a little bit on that just due to some budget cuts, but we are consistently trying to reach out to colleges beyond just the Kansas border walls. We're doing things uh, from across the Midwest region, and at some point I could bring you or provide with you data on the number of colleges and the outreach programs that we have done. Yeah, I would love to see that, and I'm sure that the board would love to see that. Um, the reason why I ask the question is because I look at our um, diversity and our actual student population, and it is quite diverse, but yes. I don't, believe I wise by just looking um, that our teaching staff reflects that so that's that's just a concern that I've, I've always had um, I know that it I think it does matter uh, so I would love to be able to see um, what you've been doing what you'll continue to do and if there's uh, anything else that I can uh, support or anyone else uh, that's on the board would appreciate that thank you thank yeah, you in, in the one um, not ready to get into details tonight about it but um, uh, we're, we're close ish I think on a teacher residency model with WSU Tech and WSU um, it's kind of an apprenticeship model that'll have <laughs> several on and off points um, so more to come in the next maybe two months, maybe I think we're we're getting close to. We're having, almost there. <laughs> yeah, we're almost there. So, um, so that will have uh, multiple on ramps, including uh, high school kids, our own high school kids. So, talking to our kids about, um, you know, the profession and the high quality. You know, that, that it is a good job and it is. Uh, there's a lot of benefits to it um, and a lot of impact you can have. So, anyway, more to come on that, but that that's still in the works. Thank so, you. yep. Thank. Thank you. And thank you. If there are no other questions, if you'll indulge me for just a minute, I have some of my team members here tonight because Absolutely. while I get the honor of being the leader, 
these are the folks that did all the work. So please do. if my talent acquisition team would please stand, manager Jenna Shabon, supervisor Caitlin Rockcliffe, and then I also have my licensure and uh, labor relations, Abby McFadden, Emily Widrig, talent acquisition specialist, and Andrea Hernandez. So they are just a small handful of this, but they really did the hard work and the heavy lifting, so thank you. Thank you, Sean, and thank you, team. Uh, is it the will of the board to take a break now or after the consent agenda? I kind of cheated and already took a break, so. Okay, Patrick, next item, please. Next item, consent. Knock. I have nothing to pull. Thank you, Hazel. I have nothing to pull. Um, I have no consent items to pull. Diane. I have nothing to pull. A melody. Uh, yes, I'd like to pull. Let me actually get it in front of me. Uh, I believe it's under number two. No, it's it's D, programs grants. Do you want to pull one, uh, two, and three? Yeah, one, one, two, and three. Okay. Yes. Uh, Julie. Nothing to pull. Kathy. Nothing to pull. I move that we adopt the consent agenda except for. D1, 2, and 3. I'll second. I think Diane was first. Yes. <laughs> Moved by Stan, Sorry, seconded by first. Diane. You should be able to vote. Motion carries 7-0. Um, Melody, did you want to discuss yeah. all three together or I, one I at do. a time? Okay, go ahead. I do. So this is, um, I'm supportive of the funding and the renewal uh, funding on each one of them. I just simply uh, wanted to make kind of a blanket statement about uh, the, the grants, these particular grants and programs that are in our school district, in, in our buildings. Um, something that we talked about earlier today, and that is these programs, and they're not all mentoring programs, they are probably going to be a, what I would call a mix and a consortium of, of different types of programming that actually, uh, where individuals are there to meet needs of students that are, are in our buildings, particularly middle and high school. Um, however, when you look at what exactly each one of the programs are doing, I would love to be able to see some consistency, and I believe it was Nock Vong that actually also mentioned this earlier today. We've talked about it um, very early on, and that is consistency in outcomes. That we as a district are, are very aware, we as a board actually receive reports uh, on and how and what these particular programs are doing in, in the buildings. I know that they are a benefit, but I think it would be great if we would actually be able to um, look and review from an accounting perspective, an accountability perspective, uh, outcomes and, and look, look at them across the board. Having said that, there's a, another uh, level that I, I wanted to see happen with our, all of the different programs, and, and that is uh, an opportunity for them to interface with one another. Some of them do um, programmatically uh, things that are very similar, um, and, and some are very, very independent and, and, and individualized in what it is that the offering of services that they provide. So I basically uh, spoke with individuals uh, at the leadership level, including the superintendent, um, and then I, I connected with uh, what I would call a community supporting partner, and that is Kansas Leadership uh, Center, and it was Dr. K. Monk Morgan, where we could actually bring these uh, parties together, these programs, their leads, the individuals that are a part uh, that work within them. Uh, together so that they could see uh, each other, meet each other. They, I've talked with several. Uh, they would love to be able to do that because some of them are not familiar with 
uh, who is doing what, and I'm not speaking of our staff in buildings and or leadership, I'm talking about programs and the persons that actually uh, are implementing the programs. So uh, I just simply wanted to give a shout out to uh, Dr. K. Monk Morgan, actually Kansas <coughs> Leadership Center, uh, for uh, saying that they would facilitate this gathering. And, um, I'm look and I know it's Dr. Polite that will actually lead it. Uh, so uh, thanks to uh, leadership here and uh, Leadership Center. So just wanted to be able to put that shout out there. Thank you. Thank you, Melody. Would you like to make a motion to uh, accept those uh, D1, 2, and 3? I move to accept D1, 2, and 3 <laughs> as written. Thank you. And I'll second this time. Okay. <laughs> Moved by Melody and seconded by Julie. Should be able to vote. Motion carries 7 0. Patrick, next item, please. Well, we can have a break now. Oh, did, did you want to take a break now? Okay. We'll take a uh, 10 minute break and be back at 8.05. The Wichita Board of Education is back in reset, uh, back in uh, order. Patrick, next item, please. Next item under operations, presenting. And, oh, sorry. Presenting the new Wichita Public Schools website. And Susie, I understand that we may do a little bit of on our own. So uh, each board member, uh, if you click on that uh, plus tab and then put in uh, USD 259 dot org and we can also do some show and tell at the end yes yeah. I so, was just gonna start them off yeah. okay. I'm okay, gonna pass I'm gonna pass it off to Wendy I, I, I wanted to take an opportunity to introduce this item because I knew that Susie would be far too humble about the amazing heavy lift that the team she led did to make this work happen. You're gonna hear about the why, and um, I hope you will be really pleased with what you see. I think this website is so fresh and active and is a great representation of who we are to the community that oftentimes visits us and we don't ever know. And that's why the website and the properties that we make available 24 seven to our community is so important. Um, when we, we started into the super heavy lift of this project, about the time um, the, the district made the decision to consider closing schools at the beginning of the calendar year. And uh, Susie graciously stepped up to lead this work and she did admit to me she didn't fully understand what she was stepping into. And um, I, I think it's impossible to understand what a heavy lift doing this, not just for a district website, but 94 school sites is. And so I wanted to take an opportunity to publicly salute Susie, um, Maria Loving, Susan Arnsman, Maria Curry, Jennifer Sipes, Michael Smith in the control booth, Josh Errett, whom you heard mentioned earlier, Cody Sater, who is the creative genius that has developed the visual brand that you see infused through the site. Am I failing to mention anyone on the team? I think the core team. There were folks all across the district um, because this was a lift not only for central office folks, but for folks in our schools. And um, I hope that you'll be pleased with what's here. It's based upon research, it's based upon data, it's based upon stakeholder feedback. And I'm super excited that um, this, this solution is responsive to the things that stakeholders told us they needed from us um, about this key resource. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Susie Finn. She's gonna share some background and then we're gonna pop over and do a little bit of a live tour for you. Welcome, Thank Susie. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, President Reeser, uh, Vice President Albert, Mr. Bielefeld, board members. Um, I am very proud and honored to have been part of this work and to be able to lead this work um, for the last 
you know, seven months or so um, since I uh, stepped up, as Wendy said. Our previous site, the last redesign, was about 2014. Um, so it served us well, but it served us a little longer than it probably should have. Um, and it started to have some challenges keeping up with ADA accessibility, mobile responsiveness, um, and things like that. So we uh, took the opportunity, and I'll explain a little bit more about timing uh, in a couple slides, but to transform the Wichita Public Schools website into something that can help us tell the story of why we are the premier district of choice in our region, uh, or not just in our region, we are the premier district of choice. Um, and this website will help us tell that story. It will help us showcase the diversity that Ms. McCray Miller mentioned earlier. It will help us communicate to families in their own languages. Um, it's going to be a fantastic resource and uh, we're going to continually improve the product as we go. Like I said, we're gonna jump into show and tell in a minute, but I wanna get through um, just a couple of screenshots and some of the, the why behind it and how we're going to evaluate progress along the way before I get out of the PowerPoint so we don't have any technical issues. So this is uh, this banner is what you see at the top of the home page when you land on it. It's not a static image, it is a video. It showcases students from every grade level, staff working with students. Um, it's a very highly visual place and Jennifer Bellinger Sipes uh, created this uh, image or this video for us and um, was instrumental along with Michael Smith in helping make sure that the visuals are able to showcase what we want to show. So when we launched on October 1st, we launched one district website, but we also launched 86 school and program websites. So it wasn't just a, web, a website relaunch, it was a relaunch of 87 website properties, which is like Wendy said, something that I didn't really understand what I was getting into when I said, sure, I'll take on leading this work. Um, the most important things that we wanna point out here that will help you and will help your constituents as they navigate the website, uh, which are probably very hard to see in this small screen, but we have a section called Find It Fast, and that is intended to help people find quickly the things that they most need, along with the icons that are right below that amazing visual space. Um, and then we also have in the footer all of our social properties as well as all of the very important things that uh, the state and ourselves tell us must be highly visible on our website. They're right there, every page of the site. And then one of the other very important things is the responsiveness based on device size. What people see as they navigate through the website will change based on whether they're on a laptop, a desktop, a mobile device, a, an iPad, um, and the content shifts with that. So why now? We wanted to make sure we can tell the story of the premier district of choice. We also wanna meet our audience where they're at on mobile devices. Over 70% of our website traffic last year was on a mobile device. So it's really important that as we develop content and as we look at the content we're putting on the site, that we're seeing how it looks to folks who are coming to us on their cell phone or other small mobile device. In addition, we wanna make sure we meet ADA Title II accessibility expectations. Um, there has been guidance that came out that government institutions, including public schools, need to make sure that their um, web and social properties meet those expectations for accessibility by 2026. By starting this website as an accessible property, we will make sure we adhere to that. We also wanna provide information access to families in multiple languages. Uh, we, you may have heard recently, we just got the numbers this year, 115 different languages spoken in the homes of our students. We have 99.7% of those languages covered through the translation tool on this new website. Uh, so I will show and tell that uh, in a moment because we know that's really critical. And then we also wanna make it easier for both our parents, students, community members and staff members to find the information that they need to find. Um, and so we've done a few things to accomplish that. The goals that we're going to measure as we move forward, um, oh, two timing issues. Uh, one was we also kind of didn't have a choice. Um, our previous website provider, Blackboard, was bought out by a company called Final Sight. So we were going to have to make a transition within the next three to five years no matter what. 
uh, with the timing around open enrollment and a need for a greater marketing presence, we set October 1st as our goal for that soft launch so that it would be ready in time for today's um, magnet and choice enrollment application opening. So that was sort of why the timing happened the way it did. Okay, so our goals that we're going to measure over time, um, making that welcoming digital front door for prospective parents and caregivers, givers, students, and staff, and that celebrates joyful learning. Uh, I heard your question earlier about recruiting diverse staff. We're making sure that the pages that we use for careers highlight the diverse staff that we do have in our district so that when folks come to our website, they can see themselves in the people represented in the work that we have on these sites. We're going to make it easier for all site visitors to find the information they need, including staff, and then we're going to ensure that content is created with an accessible, mobile, searchable, translatable approach. Anybody who went through our uh, training in the last six months heard me say that over and over again. If we make our content accessible, we also make it mobile friendly, searchable, and translatable. So those are really critical goals. So as we go through launch, we'll monitor the questions that have already come in to our communications email address. We'll do some surveys through pop-ups on the website to get feedback from visitors. Um, we will look at our Google Analytics and see how many clicks is it taking people to get through the website, how long are they having to spend on the site. On some pages, a long time might be a good thing. On other pages, a long time means they're having trouble finding what they're looking for. So we'll look into that data. Um, we'll look at the total number of pages visited, and then we'll use a tool called Audio Eye to make sure that we're meeting those accessibility standards. So how did we get here? I wanted to show you the good stuff first and then give you just a little bit of background before I do the show and tell. Uh, we had an amazing website transformation team. As Wendy mentioned, um, there were six of us that were the core team. There was the amazing media productions team that created the photos and visuals that go on the site. Uh, Josh Arrett from IST was invaluable in the technical side of things. And then we had 375 different people at our schools and departments who were given training and given access to edit their school's content and their department's content. So our team's role was to really oversee that and make sure that it was being done with those four goals in mind um, and to do a lot of the uh, learn about WPS content, uh, the things that represent your work, um, and those types of pages. We used research to create the design, to create the layout and the flow of the site. We looked at Google Analytics, online surveys, focus groups, and third-party research. And one of the third-party research pieces that I wanted to um, share, because I know often in this day of many different communication channels, we get asked a lot, why do websites even matter when we have social media? Uh, there's a website called niche.com that surveys parents uh, who are in the process of deciding what schools they want to send their students to. And one of the key pieces of information that we looked at was that 60% of those parents said that the school websites were the communication channel that influenced enrollment decisions most. Social media posts we're down at 26%. So it makes a difference to have relevant, updated website properties. Also, we have a contract with Final Site. We own this property to the extent anyone can own anything digital. Um, whereas social media sites, companies could go under, companies could get um, discouraged from use at any time. Having websites is really, really important still. And then for implementation, what did we do as a team? One of the things that was really fantastic about this new platform is something called COPE. And that stands for Create Once, Publish Everywhere. So there are pages of the site where we created the content in one spot where we can edit that at any time. And then we can make that show up on the school sites. So they don't have to worry about editing the school supply list and making sure they get that changed out before they leave for the summer. We'll do that for them on elementary school sites at least. Um, they don't have to worry about updating information about how to apply for magnet schools. We added a page to every magnet school site that says this is how you apply, here's what the process is. Um, so there are several pages throughout the site that we created the content. It'll show up on school sites so families don't have to leave that school platform, um, but they're getting consistent information wherever they're visiting. Uh, 
I mentioned the amazing photography and video work. We trained um, people over the course of about six weeks. Um, started in May with department folks and then we did school leaders in the summer, um, well, right as we came back to school. And then uh, Josh really led the work of creating a new staff hub. Uh, one of the pieces of feedback we heard a lot was people didn't know where to find information for staff to do their job. Some of it was on the <coughs> website, some of it was in SharePoint, some of it was in Google Drive, some of it was in Teams. Uh, we have a lot of different resources, which is great, but that also means that sometimes people weren't sure where to go. So this new staff hub will really be that hub for information that helps staff do their job. Um, it's all connected through our Microsoft platform that we're paying for anyway. Um, so as long as folks are using that platform to create uh, documents and materials and save them, people can find them if they have the permission to use them. So um, it will take some time for people to get used to. Not everything got shifted over right away, um, but we're continuing to work with Josh and with department leaders to make sure that that work um, happens in a timely manner. So what happens now? For the external user, for anyone landing at usd259.org, that is still the web address. So anybody that had that homepage bookmarked, no problem, still works the same way it used to. Um, pages that had a slash BOE at the end, slash bond 25, um, those are what we call short links or friendly URLs um, either already still work or will work within the next few days. Um, is a little bit more challenging than we thought to keep track of all of those. Uh, but they are being carried over um, and we'll make sure that people have access to that content. Uh, there is a pop-up that comes up uh, when people visit the homepage and it gives them a link to email our team directly if they're having trouble finding something. School websites did change to be subdomains of our site, so now it says school.usd259.org. But just like those short link or friendly URLs, if somebody keeps going to usd259.org slash Adams, they're still gonna get to the Adams website. So it won't impact the user in that way. Now, if they had pages deep into the Adams website that said slash Adams slash page slash 252, that link might break. But we have a custom 404 landing page that tells people, hey, welcome to our new website. Things shifted in the move. Here's how you can, here are tools you can use to find what you were looking for. Um, and if you still can't, here's how you can email us. Uh, so we're trying to make that transition as smooth as possible for everyone that's visiting our site. And then some of the content did move around. Um, but the goal ultimately is that any customer focused content, anything that parents need to access or that students um, considering our school district need to access or considering changing schools within the district, that that content is one click away from the homepage. And then we're already thinking about what the future looks like and making sure that this is not a we launched, we're done. It's a it's live and we're going to keep making it even better. Um, so we're going to keep looking at PDFs and embedded graphics that did make their way onto, the current, onto this new site and work with the people that have created that content to make sure that we can meet those accessibility guidelines. We're going to create a plan for having testimonials with parents and students to increase that marketing content on school sites in particular. One of the other pieces of data that we learned from that niche study was that about 70% of parents said one of the things that would prevent them, or that would make them take a school off their shortlist was not being able to find any um, reviews or testimonials about a school. So making sure that we're actively working with schools to create that content for their sites will be a next step in the life of this website. And then we'll continue to offer training and best practice information to both schools and departments. Uh, on October 21st, uh, Susan Arnsman and I will be leading training at the Clerical In-Service. We'll have uh, three morning sessions and three afternoon sessions uh, to offer to all of our um, front office and administrative office staff who are helping to update calendars and highlights and posts and some of them are even doing are the main person for their website. So we're going to make sure that we continue to offer that training over time and we have a team set up in Microsoft Teams um, that will share tips and tricks with all of those 375 website editors uh, so they can continue to see what's working, what's not, um, and how we can make this the best product it can be. So 
that is the official presentation. And I will hopefully easily hop out of that and open our new website. Ta-da! Um, so the first thing I want to show you is that translate tool that I mentioned. Uh, folks can go up here, click on translate, and then we do have the first five languages listed in order of the most spoken languages in the district so they can get to those quickly. And then any content that was put in to the site in live text is translated. We'll still see occasionally some things where a graphic was created that has text in it, that won't translate. So that's one of those accessibility, searchability, translatability things that we'll continue to train even ourselves on um, and remind ourselves that what we did on the old site doesn't always work on the new site. Um, and then we have some fantastic videos here of our uh, teachers and staff that have been featured in my WPS story um, and that were featured in our I Teach Because series this summer. Um, we've got some information about the things that make us the district of choice and our live calendar. Um, so you can see almost all of that information translated from English to Spanish pretty seamlessly. Um, so we're really grateful to Maria Curry um, and Brenda Torres from the MES team who made sure that we have dictionaries in the back end that translate the right words the right way and words that shouldn't be translated are not getting translated. Um, so that was another team that really helped make sure that this website could go live well. If you want to know where to find yourselves, the board information is under Learn About WPS. So you can go right here to Board of Education. It's also where we have our departments, uh, where we've got a quick list of contact information, our school and building directory. So a lot of great content is here under that Learn About. But from the marketing perspective, this Enroll in WPS and Discover WPS areas are where we're really working to tell the story of what our district has to offer. Um, so we have photography, we have links to pages throughout the site um, that help people understand just how much we have to offer in terms of choice and opportunity as a district. And then also making sure that we are putting our information about finding your school um, and the difference between out of district enrollment and in district enrollment in as many places as we can. So um, we're really excited about what we have to offer. Uh, there's a lot I could take you through, but I know I've probably already taken more than my 10 minutes. Um, so I will pause there and ask for any questions. We did. Oh, I was just going to say, I think we could be here all night. Uh, just <laughs> clicking. I mean, I'm, I'm a, sorry, I tuned you out a little bit because I was like, oh, this is really cool. So I just want to echo uh, for Wendy, Susie, and team. You know, I mean, great job. It is. Uh, it looks new, fresh, uh, updated. The video is great. A uh, lot, of, lot of work uh, put into it. Um, so I just wanted to echo the thanks. I didn't need to say anything else, Dan. No, no, that's OK. Um, I had a quick question. Um, you said the reviews of the schools important for parents when they are new to the community or trying to decide on whether to enroll. Mm -hmm. uh, and when did you say those reviews are going to have to be coordinated? And when, uh, when? That is a next phase, so we don't have a specific plan on that yet, but I would say that's something we'll work on ahead of the sort of open enrollment time frame that comes later. In I the was going to say, uh, I think spring is when most families try to make a decision on what the following school year is going to look like for them. Uh, so I'm s assuming maybe getting that in in sometime in the spring. Uh, we can definitely work on that. Yes. I mean, honestly, the magnet application is open right today. now. Yeah, mm -hmm. today. So, um, but yeah, I, I, I think yeah. you're right about the kind of overall pattern. Of you just caught my attention when you said. I'm sorry, what was the percentage? That it was 70% of parents eliminated a school from their um, short list of schools if they couldn't find any reviews or testimonials or anything. We do have profiles on niche.com and on great schools, um, right. but it's not an area, and on Google, I'm sure, um, 
it's not an area that we've focused a lot of attention on actively seeking that and finding folks to also put that on directly on the website. So um, it may not be a, we get all of them by this spring, but it's something that will create a plan to phase that in. Okay. Hazel, did you withdraw yours? Okay. Melody? Susie and Wendy, this is fantastic. I love it. I could just, I could just play. I mean, it's, it's, you, you see who's in our district. I mean, it's, the district is just right there. It's yeah. just, it's lovely to look at. And it's easy, it, it's easy to navigate. You, you all did a great job. This is, Thank you. I love it. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> he was he's busy on, clicking. He is on the website. Yeah, he is on the website. <laughs> he was also distracted by the website. It's just that yeah, good. Yeah, this. <laughs> Knock. Yeah, I'm just playing through the uh, Vietnamese translations right now. Uh, no, did all the comments. I'm very grateful that you have a lot of these different languages accessible for folks. Awesome. And. Something that Maria wanted me to point out if I had an opportunity, so I'm gonna take this opportunity, um, is that there is even a way that within a single school or a single page, if there are words that we know different languages translate a different way than we would like them to, we can edit that. So it's a really fantastic uh, translation tool. I was gonna say an immediate one would be for a OK. Elementary it translated as a Dook Roy. Okay. Like, I mean, it li literally just be like, okay, for like, instead of like, don't cry. Excellent, yes, we will make note of that. And let me go back to the queue. <laughs> Get off the website, stop playing around. <laughs> you can play later. Can, can, later. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions or concerns or uh, comments about the, uh, this item? This is great. Susie, we appreciate the effort. We really do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Patrick, next item, please. Next item, under miscellaneous, superintendent's report. Kelly. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, and echo what everyone said. Uh, great work with that. that. That one was maybe a little bit unusual as far as the board report go, but I think it was really worthwhile um, to get the exposure <coughs> for you guys to see what it looks like. You can share it, you can tell, um, pass it along. So um, I got a few things I wanted to hit on tonight. One thing I shared at DLT last week um, with the, DL the district leadership team is I was able to hear one of the Blue Angels pilots at Northeast Magnet uh, a few weeks ago when they were here. He came and talked to uh, the JROTC kids and some of the engineering aviation kids. And he talked about how after every performance, um, they spend two hours watching the film of their of what they did and all the different angles and if they were in the positions in the right way and I don't know all the technical stuff but um, every time they perform they do two hours of review and feedback and reflection um, and I think that's that's part of what what I try to do what I hope the team tries to do um, we obviously thank fully or not flying airplanes around because I don't think we would be good at that. But what we're trying to do is navigate a district and create a great environment for kids. And so as things happen and things come up and we make decisions, um, we do a lot of two hour video reflection, right? Metaphorically speaking, obviously, um, to make sure that uh, next time we're better, next time we're improved. Um, I do want to lift up too that uh, how many of you got an ang uh, email or a phone call from an angry teacher who didn't get their boxes delivered this summer when they moved schools, right? You didn't hear anything, did you? So when we do great work, we don't hear anything, right? And that is to say to people are ungrateful. I'm not saying that at all. But when we do things well, that's, that's you know, kind of the expectation, and maybe it should be, um, that we, we do things well a lot, and our team does a really uh, good job in a lot of ways. And those aren't the things we usually hear about. So, um, but that doesn't mean we're perfect and that doesn't mean we have everything figured out. We definitely have room to improve, me included. Um, some literal paperwork stuff that I want um, you to think about. I was gonna bring the Lit Summit uh, handouts tonight and I forgot. 
um, but you also tonight received the District at a Glance. Um, so if you would like a stack of copies of this, um, email Joseph and tell him a number, and he will, however he makes that happen, he will make that happen. I don't know if that's print shop or copy or whatever. Diane and I oh, have Thank some. you. We also have um, a, a big box of these that we're passing out here uh, that is the invitation to the, the WPS. Uh, first time we're gonna do a uh, Wichita Public Schools Literacy Summit in November. Um, so I wanna uh, provide you with a stack of these also um, to either hand out or post at um, churches, grocery stores, wherever you might wanna post. Um, it's really an open invitation to anyone in the community who cares about literacy. Um, we're going to do this on November 14th, um, doing it deliberately the afternoon and evening um, before the KASB conference so that if there are leaders across the state who want to come here about the work we're doing in literacy, we want them to be invited and uh, part of that. Um, so we're, we'll, we'll provide more information about the schedule. There's the QR code is a place to sign up. Obviously, you, go, you guys are all invited, but we're really looking at um, leaders, uh, elected officials, uh, parents, um, community members who support, uh, teachers, principals, uh, everyone to uh, be, in part, be invited and part of the discussion. The, the first part of it is going to be a kind of a vendor fair of our community members who do a lot of support for us with literacy. Um, so kind of a come and go a little bit and then the program, uh, main program will start at 4.30 I think uh, with a data walk with our data as a district and kind of where we're at with things. Um, and then we'll have a couple different panel discussions. One of the panels focused on um, the, the what, uh, the what and how of literacy. So what are we doing with letters? What are we doing with early literacy? Um, how are we trying to make uh, uh, a significant impact with kids? And then uh, a panel discussion about barriers because we know that's a, uh, that takes more than just us, right? There's barriers that our kids have um, all up and down uh, our community, and so um, just having a, a general conversation about that. So I um, so wanted to mention the, the Literacy Summit um, that's coming up. A couple other things that are just kind of issues that uh, have been, have been uh, around and I wanted to update the entire board on. Um, foster care, I know a few of you guys, we've engaged in discussions about foster care. Um, we are having at our clerical in-service, um, we're gonna really focus on transcripts and ensuring students get transcripts quick. I know it seems like a small, minute, minute piece, but uh, when a student in foster care, especially at a high school, um, moves often from school to school, uh, getting uh, as current and updated information about their classes uh, is really critical. So we're gonna work with clerical staff on that. Um, and we've been in conversation with what's now Ember Hope uh, about c different models of, you know, um, we have a certain model of delivery of instruction at the children's home. Could that work in other areas as far as with some of the other students that are in foster care? Um, so no, nothing really, no action yet, but uh, conversations with uh, those folks. Um, I already mentioned the teacher res residency. Um, we're working on that. You know, I wanted to, to bring up um, the second speaker tonight spoke about ADA accessibility, and she was she had the right answer, right? You all have capital outlay funds to do these things, which which is the right answer, right? We do have capital outlay funds to do these things. We just can't do all of the things, um, and part of the reason some of the ADA things haven't been haven't been uh, haven't happened yet is because we prioritize the secured entrances, and we're doing those first. Um, and I think you guys know this, but the secured entrance at Cessna, uh, you voted on last April and was finished um, in July. So it happened um, uh, right in time, and we're, we're almost to the end of the road with all of the secured entrances. Um, we have four left, four schools left, if Luke's not here, four or seven. Uh, I'll, I'll get you the names of the schools if I didn't share that with you already. Um, uh, I wanted to note a couple building or a couple committees and, and community groups that, that are going on. Um, I, I mentioned and shared with you the building use committee. Um, so we, we have a group of community members that's working on um, the, they're, they're, if, if you didn't catch it in the, in the minutes, they're gonna create a matrix for decision making on what to do with closed buildings. Uh, we, we voted to surplus three buildings tonight. So they will start that process with those three. Um, and then as we continue, we'll 
add more buildings to that uh, through the process. Um, we also had our first uh, meeting with the with a group of uh, Hispanic community leaders um, that had 40 maybe or 40 to 50 uh, Hispanic leaders, 34. Um, and it, it was a it was such a great robust meeting. Um, what we thought might be a semi-annual meeting is now a monthly meeting. Um, we tried to cram in. Uh, Gil did strategic plan and he did graduation rate and just that triggered a bunch of questions, right? And so uh, we tried to cram about five hours worth of stuff in about 45 minutes and I think it felt a little hurried and rushed and so that, you know, they said, hey, could we get more engagement? We're gonna teach you the uh, tour of the Future Ready Center with that group next month um, and then the Literacy Summit will be uh, an invitation to that group to be engaged too. So um, great work by Fabiana Maria, I could take no credit. I showed up and, and said a few things and they did all the, all the legwork there. Um, and just a couple other things. I think it's, um, it's important to acknowledge progress and I think tonight we saw some progress that you guys have known some things going on for a while um, that, that, that have been on my heart as far as things that uh, I believe we've needed to do. Um, teacher leadership uh, was one. Um, you know, you, Chris, I, I didn't know he had the seed of the idea from 15 years ago, but you know, I, when I met with him last spring, I said, you do all this pipeline work for building leaders and uh, assistant principals and you know, all these things. What about people that, that don't wanna be building leaders, but we need to grow as leaders in the classroom? Um, and like he said, you hire the right people and you pass it off to them and let them run, and good golly, they've done great work with it. But um, it's cool to see it, it happen. Student board, um, it's really cool to see uh, not, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of the, the seed that was planted with Super Sac is now blossoming into a bush or a tree um, with what I, what I believe is uh, gonna be impactful for us and for them. Um, the Kansas Leadership Center, the training that they went through this summer was profound. Um, you know, and I, I think, I hope we're ready because they're gonna lead. I hope we're ready. <laughs> Because I'm serious because they're going to come to us and they're going to, they're, I, I believe they'll ask good, good questions that are appropriate, um, but, but may make us make some decisions. So um, super exciting to see that happen. Um, and then um, the, the, Melody already mentioned it, but the mentoring collaboration that we have going on next month. So I th what you'll see, and I just want to articulate this to the, to the whole board, um, one, of the, one of the things that we're going to try to do um, in that next November board meeting is really tie a theme to the the meeting. So we're going to invite you guys to do literacy walks the week before the board meeting. Um, we'll break you up into groups and we'll go to different schools and we'll go in and see what's going on um, with the phonemic routine in kindergarten and with uh, you know science of reading in first and second grade. Then we'll have the board meeting. We'll report on the fall fast bridge data. We'll tell you about um, with letters and, and what we're at with that. Um, and then we'll follow that up with the community engagement at the Literacy Summit. So um, I see this as being a model for our big, you know, strategic plan goals as a way to, you know, kind of show you guys, um, show, show everyone at the board meeting and then invite to the community in a, in a particular way um, to really strategically tell about these are the main things and we want to keep them the main things. So um, just want to open the curtain behind that strategy. We won't do that every month. That may, that may might be a lot for you all, um, but we'll probably do it again in January, February, and then probably again a, a second time in the spring. So, President Reeser, that's all I have. Thank you very much, Kelly. Patrick, next item, please. Next item, new business. And then I think we'll go ahead and combine B and C. Uh, anyone have any new business, Board of Education reports, or requests? See none. Patrick, next item, please. Next item, adjournment. Is there a motion to adjourn? I second. Moved by Kathy, seconded by Diane. Motion carries 7-0. We are adjourned until next month. Thank you.